and it is very much uh, a manifestation of the kind of thing we want to achieve through our information code. To my mind, the recent parliamentary election in India to a watershed movement, or at least can turn out to be a watershed movement in Indian history. Uh, the result was quite stunning. A party uh, which has been in the driver's seat for most of the period since independence has been decimated. And a party which had very little electoral presence at the time of independence is now in driver's seat. So not only <laughs> there was an electoral rout, and not only that the regime has changed, but it is possible that the conception of what makes India a nation may have changed. Now you know that uh, BJP led, uh, Modi led BJP party really ran on economic platform, growth and governance. But if you compare the two parties, Indian National Congress and BJP, there is little to distinguish in terms of their economic ideology. I mean, this is evident from the recent budgets, from their manifestos and so on. Where they differ from each other is really the conception of what constitutes a nation. Or, for that matter, how to interpret the word secular. So I think uh, it is, uh, this, can, this can not only pose uh, economic challenges, but some social challenges for years to come. And I think it's uh, time has come for us to assess, uh, or at least uh, find an explanation for the electoral rug, and also what are the implications for the future. Um, now you know that uh, uh, when we talk about economic and social challenges in one session is always a, quite a big challenge but uh, today we are privileged to have two eminent scholars Abhijit Banerjee of MIT a versatile economist who has thought very deeply about uh, Indian economy and Indian society and uh, Mukul, S Mukul K. Swan uh, of uh, Jamia Milia Ishmali University uh, who is a historian, academic historian but also a novelist and a, a contributor, a regular columnist for the Telegram. So what, what I would like to do is to um, start the conversation by a few questions um, and uh, let the conversation roll. And uh, at the end of the uh, discussion, we will uh, throw the floor open for questions. Okay. So, uh, so first of all, um, I would like to ask uh, what what is possibly the explanation for the electoral rout in the last election? I mean, if you look at uh, the economic performance over the last 10 years, except for the last few years, the growth was pretty healthy, poverty was going down, and even during the last two years when the uh, growth has slowed down, the poverty decline was uh, happening at a reasonable rate. But then what is it? That, uh, is it? Is it that people were uh, really uh, spooked by the what they read in the business pages of the newspapers? Was it just the leadership vacuum that was created? Was it the corruption scandals? Or is it simply inevitable that for emerging economies, for the societies, which are slowly gathering economic strength, it's inevitable that uh, a large segment of the population really yearns for sort of muscular national uh, 
cultural nationalism. So anyway, uh, no, it's also possible. It is a question of uh, frustrated aspirations. The aspirations were, were rising during the years of fast growth. Um, so my first question to both panelists is really, um, how do they account for the disenchantment, the frustration, or the, uh, the uh, strong, uh, uh, denied, strong uh, negative uh, uh, vote that the ruling party received and, uh, and, and uh, BJP victory? Uh, I think I've been invited to speculate, so I'll speculate. I have no, um, I've done no empirical work on this subject. I don't even know what the correlates of this particular outcome are. So it's entirely um, you know, thinking while lying in bed, which has its disadvantages. Um, so I. As I see, I think there are two things that happen. I think one you alluded, I think you alluded to both. Many things that should happen. Two things that were, I think are really important. One I think is just there was some sense that now finally we've arrived, and then that was taken away. I think, I think that sense of arrival, you know, if you read the discourse of uh, India 2010, it's really a discourse of, you know. Finally, we, we are big, one of the big boys, and we are arrived. And, and I think that was taken away from us. I think that sense that we, suddenly we looked intolerable, we looked fragile, we looked like any other country. And, and to say that you know, this is you know, as good as anywhere else, or any, those are all useful facts. But I think in the end, that's not what people were calibrating by. They were calibrating by a sense of, of uh, is, is this the country we believe in? And I think the, I think the, I think somewhat, somewhat fortuitous success of, of the, in kind of at least not collapsing during the 2008 to 10 period actually added to that because that you know we were special. We were now finally we had arrived, and I think that's extremely important. I think. The sense of disappointment, really, uh, and I think then you look for what's wrong. And I think there were many things. It's easy to find things that are wrong once you start looking for them. It's very easy to find things that are wrong. There were many things that are wrong. There was clearly a government that was very much uh, sort of reluctant to take hard decisions and um, was constantly dragging its feet on many things. I think the corruption issues were. As I see it, there were two separate things. It was a confluence of two things. I think one of the things that was very striking is I think the mood switch happened during, or it started during this period when the UP basically thought it could get away with uh, not taking any action on corruption. I think that particular thing of, of just letting it go, that was, was, it was seen. I don't know whether it was so much the sense that there is so much corruption around, but I think people kind of know that. It was more that it, this is, now, now we are, we're supposed to have a different kind of government with a different kind of prime minister, and he's just doing the same thing. And that sense of, again, the sense of disappointment. Second element in it, so that's, I think, one thing. Second element in it, which kind of draws on the same set of factors, is, is this pervasive sense that you know, we are constantly battling to uh, get what we are supposed to be entitled to. I think that, that sense of constant battle. So corruption, I don't think it's, I think it's the mapping from the corruption in the newspaper to the corruption in everyday life. That's, that's what's very important. I think mean, that's what, there's a reason why, there's a reason why uh, the N NDA took <coughs> governance as a central part of the agenda. And that's, it's because I think there is, and I'll, maybe I'll expand on this later, I think there is an entire, I mean, this is a historical moment where this sense, 
that you know this guy, this kind of impunity uh, that's been going on for so long just can't last anymore. Is is there? I think, and that that is, is, I think, is rooted in the same sense that we have arrived as a nation and we can't, as a nation that has a claim to some greatness in the world, this can't just be how it is. I think all of that's of, of, of a piece. So those things, there's a confluence between those two things and I think that's the, at the core of what the disenchantment I think is that. That's, as I said, it's pure speculation. Well, unlike professional economists, who actually uh, deal with, uh, with hard numbers. Political, com political commentators are used to absolutely frictionless generalization. So I feel, you know, uh, no hesitation at all in telling you why I think uh, uh, the UK lost. No, I think, uh, I think Abhijit spoke of, uh, uh, of two things. One is the, se the sense of arrival and this uh, resentment of the sense of impunity that uh, those of us who, uh, who were in Delhi during uh, I think what was one of the sort of psychological turning points for the middle class, uh, as far as this uh, regime, the UP regime was concerned, was uh, the Commonwealth Games. And there seemed to be a kind of carnival of happy, brazen uh, corruption, which uh, the Congress uh, thought it could actually uh, live up without uh, consequences. But I think, I think uh, just to add to what Abhijit said, uh, one the Congress, I think we have to recognize that the Congress was in power for 10 years. All parliamentary systems uh, carry, incumbency carries a certain cost. And this was, uh, this was a party that had been in the face of the government uh, for 10 whole years. But I think added to incumbency and added to the sense of frustration that uh, we were uh, not just an emerging nation, but an arrived nation which wasn't actually getting its due. I think we underestimated our costs how much these things were magnified by the essential nature of the UPA. Uh, and here I'm speaking of, of dynasty, of the way in which, uh, rhetorically, uh, the Congress dynasty becomes the focus of all these resentments. This sense that over the last 20 years, one of the major stories of Indian politics has been, if you will, the provincialization of power. The sense that uh, if you look at uh, Mr. Modi, Mr. Modi is not one of the BJP's uh, pan-Indian leaders, uh, if you will. He's not Mr. Jaitley, he's not uh, Mr. Sushma Swaraj. He is someone who began as a provincial sattva and uh, demonstrated that he had uh, a style of governance, a model which he felt worked, <laughs> persuaded others that it did in fact work. I think one of the stories in the last 20 years has been the inability of the Congress to, in a sense, integrate this provincialization of political power. Uh, and the reason why it's unable to do this is simply because it has at its heart a dynastic form of government. A dynast is useful so long as he helps provincial politicians win elections. Because otherwise he's obviously an obstruction because the top job is always uh, not up for grabs. And I think what we saw here over the last three or four years is this sense of uh, helpless indignation, even, even amongst people who were predisposed towards the UPA or hostile to the NDA, in the sense that you can't be serious. You can't seriously go into an election with a Dauphin as your, as your leader without even having the nerve to declare him uh, as Prime Minister's material. Partly, of course, he, because he wasn't Prime Minister's material. Partly because the dynasty had got to a stage where it didn't even believe that governing experience was important for the purposes of national projection. So I think, without wanting to refine too much on it, this was an election in which one party effectively didn't turn up. <laughs> why, why do you think uh, the Congress party, which has been in power for so long, uh, finds it necessary to invest all the power in the dynasty? I think uh, when one thinks of the Congress, the Congress is actually two different parties. There's a point till, shall we say, the mid-60s when the Congress, despite the overwhelming presence of Nehru, remains in many ways uh, a party of, uh, of post dependence equals. Uh, after the death, death of Lal Bahadur Shastri, this is not new, uh, Mrs. Gandhi takes over and begins to consolidate 
a process of dynastic succession. And after that, uh, the family becomes, in many ways, talismanic of, as Mr. Rahul Gandhi is happy to tell us, uh, a sense of martyrdom, a sense of sacrifice. And all of this becomes the political capital of the Congress. And I wouldn't actually underestimate this. This served them, in a sense, politically, though with diminishing returns uh, for many years. The fact that they chose not to recognize that capital had run out was, in fact, their misfortune in this particular election. Because I think they chose to read the last two elections in 2004 and 2009 as vindications of, if you will, the charismatic power of the dynasty, when they were, in fact, the outcomes of, uh, of contingent events and clever uh, political calculation. I also think, I mean, if you just bring down the list of, I mean, right now, the Congress has no way. I mean, that's what it is. If you have to think about it, it would take, I mean, as a, a, a real grassroots politician with a strong base, doesn't exist in Congress. The closest thing that they could have done is maybe Sharad Power. I mean, at least is somebody with a, a real base and a real grassroots presence. There is no one else in the Congress who actually could have been. I mean, that I, I started from this view that why is it this guy the obvious leader? And then I think, don't you think about it? There isn't really anyone else. We go through the list of the senior ministers. There's really no one else. I mean, it's like you know, a bunch of people who are like Anthony who have really no credibility. I mean, I think that's 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 a, that. I think so. It's a, it's a much deeper problem in, in the Congress. It's something that's, I mean, the fact that the rise of local powerful leaders was, in, I think, as, I mean, the part of the dynastic politics was was that we, we should not have local powerful leaders. And that is a long-term process by which local powerful leaders arise and become sort of substantive presences in the party. That didn't happen. And so that, I, think, I think that's, that's it's, it's, it's a, I mean, if you thought that you could suddenly think of some, I mean, I, I wrote an op-ed on this, and I, I, I don't see that anyone who would come up to the table if you offered the job. I, mean, no, I think that's very interesting, you, you mentioning Sharad Pawar, because if you look at, if you look, look at 98 and 99, 98 and 99 is when the last two powerful, you know, the grassroots politicians you're talking about, the last two major provincial suburbs secede from Congress. So, Mamata leaves and Sharad Pawar leaves. And the latest of these, of course, is the Andhra Delhi. I mean, just think of Andhra. The Congress owned Andhra. Uh, the rump state that exists, if you take that entire behind, is run by a party which is essentially the Congress by another name. But like the Trinamool and the Nationalist uh, Congress Party, uh, the YSR Congress has discovered that it makes no sense at all for you as a powerful provincial politician to remain within the Congress. Your leverage is infinitely greater if you are, in fact, outside of it, because then you can actually bargain for power. Whereas within the Congress, you're subject to the diktats of ten jangpa. So we have seen powerful grassroots provincial leaders systematically secede from the Congress over the past few 16 years. The Andhra instance is, is the latest one. In fact, Andhra should actually be taught in business schools and in, as an instance of <clears throat> how not to manage a political circumstance. And the, but the reason behind it is a chronic one. The reason is that if you have a dynasty that runs a political party, and if the top job is not up for grabs, the only reason the raison d'etre of the dynasty must be that it can win you charismatically national elections. And the Congress hasn't been able to do this for a while now. So I think that as Ovid says, you have, uh, you have a long-term problem. You can't incubate provincial leaders. If you look at the BJP, for example, while Mr. Modi is the most uh, uh, eminent of them, you have leaders in uh, Madhya Pradesh, in Chhattisgarh, who are in fact long-standing leaders, who are not trivial people whom a central BJP can mess around with. These are substantial people. The Congress seems unable in its front bench to have anybody who's uh, a practicing politician of any substance. I mean, if you look at them, they were, uh, they were a group of uh, clever, successful lawyers, for the most part, who, who were unable to win their own seats, leave alone 
makes each one else. <laughs> Well, so, but then now we have a situation where the only national party could be BJP and the only opposition would rest in the regional parties. How do you think that's going to play out and what are the implications for the future? You know, I mean, um, I think the, the question is actually more complicated than that because if you look at the North, over the past 10, 15 years, uh, UP has been, in a sense, the stronghold of regional politics. Whether it's the Samajwadi Party or whether it's, uh, whether it's the BSP, UP almost had become uh, a province, a state within the state. It, uh, it didn't seem to obey a central dictator. But the extraordinary thing about this election is how completely in North India the BJP or if you will, the BJP and the NDA has dominated these parliamentary elections. So it's not even as if you can come up with the easy formulation that it will be the BJP versus very strong and substantial uh, provincial leaders. Yes, this is true in the case of, the, of Bengal, it's true in the case of, uh, of Tamil Nadu. But what's also interesting is that both in, uh, in Bengal, in, uh, in Tamil Nadu, I mean, who would have thought that we would be at a pass when uh, when the BJP would win more seats in Tamil Nadu, in the DMK. When the BJP would win as many seats in Bengal as the CPM. So, I don't think, uh, I think the magnitude of this victory is, uh, is quite remarkable and doesn't necessarily show up in the percentages. So, the BJP won uh, just over 30% of, of the popular vote. And I think this is, in a sense, um, uh, uh, misleading because the BJP had a system of alliances uh, where it forswore in a sense of consequences. Its share of the vote would probably have been higher if it had actually uh, uh, contested those. So I think uh, the BJP's percentage vote share doesn't actually adequately reflect uh, how much of a blowout this election was. Um, I Abhijit, uh, it seems like the economic challenges for the new government are pretty much the same as the economic challenges that the UPA government faced. Um, first of all, do you agree? Or, uh, and what do you think, what would, what would be your advice to the new government to um, reclaim the confidence the voters had? So, uh, let me go back to something that I alluded to. Um, before, because I, I, it's, it's, it's sort of, in my way of thinking, it's central. I think as a country, we're going through a phase which uh, I like to compare with the 1890 to 1910 period in the US. This is the, what's called the progressive era. What happened in the progressive era was that the US goes from a country which is essentially run through corrupt networks. Of, of local politicians to one where there is a set of very powerful uh, across-the-board legislation which ev eventually uh, restricts the power of those local leagues and make it a much more, uh, you know, much more conventional democracy. Say. This, I think, and part and the reason that, that happens, and that's coincided for a while with the rise of the left in the U.S. And this is the period when the socialist vote in 1912, Eugene Debs gets 20% of the vote or something. So it's, 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 start. It's, a, it's a very interesting period where the key issue is corruption. People suddenly feel, and corruption in the sense, not in the sense of Asian games, because this was not a big issue in the US, and it was, but it wasn't the issue, politically the big issue. The, the big issue for the muckraking press, which is the, the famous. Uh, uh, they were described as <coughs> mockers. Was the lo was local corruption? It was like somebody doing something at a local level, stealing from uh, the government, um, little local groups that were being deprived of their rights. In the sense that rights are impunity is not acceptable, and rights is not. I think we are, we are close to that. We, as a nation, have decided that that's potentially our right. I think the BJP 
and the UP and anybody else will eventually have to deal with it. I think there are pockets of the country where that's much less true. West Bengal is one, but I think it's yeah, this perception is not, not nearly as strong. I think partly as a as a, um, you know, the structural local politics, this is a separate topic. Uh, um, but I think there are I think there's a sense in which this <coughs> particular I think the UPA sense that and it and you look at the UPA, it's been, I think, you, 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 you talked about you know, growth rates being high during the UPA. In fact, it did a whole bunch of stuff. It's not that, I think the thing that is slightly unfair is that the UPA is blamed for having done nothing. But if you look at the number of landmark legislations that happened, the, you know, the Right to Information Act, the right to uh, the, uh, the uh, the uh, the National Green Tri Tribunal, the, the Right to Education Act, the, the, the Right to Food Act. Many of these acts I don't like, but as but they were very major legislations. They were very major legislations. They were they had it, it, they were they were intended to the the you know the, the and I think many of these were intended to change the relationship of the citizen with the state. And then they will, in the long run, they will. They will create, they create a basis for a very different negotiation. <coughs> Sometimes I think uh, the way, way that will play out will be you know, very positive. Sometimes maybe less positive, but it it's a, it's, it's a changes, changes the landscape. And this, this change in the landscape is a partly a response to a sense of that Without this creating this set of, I mean, this set of institutional uh, reforms, uh, we are going to eventually come to a, a kind of a set of in, internal civil wars. So I think we, we, we need to create some way of negotiating on sensitive or sensitive social and political issues, which have to do, which which will go through some process. I think this was important. This, in many ways immediately created a bunch of roadblocks. You know, you have to do this, this, this. The National Green Tribunal can hold up things. Land rights uh, can hold up things. I mean, you see today they're trying to change the 2014 land act. So I say, so it's, 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 and these can all hold up things. And they create roadblocks, they create resentments, the business community doesn't like them. Um, and many other people don't like them sometimes for good reason. But it, it's, I think it's a way, it, it creates a landscape which is very different from the landscape of 15 years ago. I think it's going to be a very different thing. It's, it's not one where, if you try to use the executive power to drive through a lot, it'll happen for a little bit. And you can do it where I think there is slack. But if you try to change a lot of things by pure executive power, it's going to hit roadblocks. And then, so I, my sense is that that's something that the NDA government will recognize. It will slowly start to, and then it's kind of the same landscape as the UK. It has, it has, business will want things, but it's not clear that in this landscape, the National Green Tribunal, what you do with it, it will have views on what business can and can't do, what you do. No, but it seems to me there are two things, right? One is you can have a badly designed legislation. Um, and some things are within the powers of the central government. You know, Land Acquisition Act is an example. That if, if it in fact designed better, uh, um, things could be better. But there are a lot of other things where you can have a perfectly designed legislation. And the implementation is bad, right? And, uh, this whole business about governance is about implementing even the acts which are designed properly, right? And the implementation is bad because, as you were mentioning before, the institutional structure through which things are implemented has been corroded to some extent, right? And when people talk about institutional reform, what exactly do they mean? I mean, how do you reform institutions at the grassroot level, the panchayats and so on, right? In fact, uh, we had this, uh, we devolved power, to the, at the panchayat level, exactly with this thing in mind, to bring citizen and state together, so you can, uh, the gov government is more accountable, etc. But uh, it works highly imperfectly, so what 
this is a possible solution. Can I, 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 I would like to get into this, but let me just say one thing. So, I think that there are two separate uses of the word governance here, and I think, so I think there, are, there is a sense in which part of the, part of the challenge was an interpretation of, of, of what was going wrong was that we need to just devolve more power, give more power to the citizens. Whether that, I, I totally agree with your, the implication of what you're saying, which is that there's another way to deal with this, which is to use more central authority to, to actually have a political will to punish the doctors who don't show up. I, I think that's a different sense of governance, and I think both are important. My point was not that these are, these are, alter, these are just alternatives, these are both problems. But I think the second the sense of governance, which is a sense of creating, let's create some rights for people so that they can fight back. This sense of governance creates constraints on the economic landscape. That's the only problem I was saying. I was not saying that there isn't enough, that this other problem of governance, which is a much more about implementation problem. But I think this, this particular one is, is the response to, instead of solving the problem of the, the teacher who doesn't show up by, you know, the old fashioned way of sending an inspector to school, uh, you, you solve it by uh, trying to give the panjaya the power, and then you fail. And in, in education, uh, they fail miserably. That's one of the reasons why the Right to Education Act, was. if you look at the draft bill for that act, it had parental control to the point of firing teachers. The only thing which changed between the draft act and the actual act is that, that was taken out. So it, it, there's a sense in which this battle is going on exactly inside those acts, but those acts were intended to create some, to fix those problems. They won't fix those problems necessarily, but they, they are in the process of changing the political landscape, sometimes making you know, certain kinds of decisions harder, certain, and certain, and certain amount of executive action, I think, will be more, I think they're just a bit more limited scope for executive action. <laughs> That's, that, and, and the panchayat is a good example of that. In the end, <laughs> what Narega has done is, is increase the budget of the panchayat by a magnitude. And therefore, the elections are so much more competitive. People, and th this is a good thing. This is a good thing. People now care about it of winning, and that's going to have some long-term consequences, I suspect. So it's, it's not, all of these things have, you know, yes, there's corruption in the local government, there's corruption everywhere. I think the part of what was missing in the panchayat was that there was, mm, the stakes were too low. Now at least the stakes are higher. So there's more competition, and there's some evidence that that's the consequence. You know, I'm interested in the, in this right to education. I remember when, <coughs> Uh, uh, it's, its implication in Delhi, for example, one of its implications in Delhi was that uh, at one point it was decided that 25% of, uh, of all seats in, in, in private schools would actually go to underprivileged neighborhood uh, children. It's, it's in the act. It's in the act. And uh, there, was, uh, there was enormous pushback from private schools uh, on this. And I don't think it's actually come to pass. I don't think you have. Last it's summers in private schools. It's not been taken out. It's, 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 it's in de jure it exists. It de jure it exists. All over the country. And I remember, uh, you know, uh, writing about this at the time, saying that one of the reasons why these private schools are, in a sense, misguided in pushing back is because when we think of a republic, uh, you know, that, uh, that, that triumvirate of terms, uh, liberty, equality, and fraternity, the run of this back is always fraternity. It's almost as if liberty and equality have meanings we understand, but fraternity remains, uh, you know, a nice way to end. Uh, you, you know, you have instead of two, you have a third, and so again, the rest of it. <laughs> but I think uh, the right to education I've got one thing right in this business of underprivileged children from neighborhoods being a substantial part of private schools, which is that the one thing India needs more than any other country in the world, and this can be said without any reservation, is the idea of fraternity. Because I don't think there is any society in the world that is more effortlessly divided in descriptive ways than ours. I think all of us, if we look back upon our school lives, and if we think of, uh, of Hindu surnames, I think you'll find very quickly that your schools have self-selected themselves from 
a very small section of the population of even day. So this idea of fraternity, which seemed to be at the heart of this act, seemed just enormously welcome. Even if you were going to use uh, executive action to force schools to acknowledge this. It didn't happen. It exists de jure, it doesn't actually exist in fact. There are no schools that have, uh, in Delhi, that private schools that have opened up, opened their doors to 25%. Uh, I know I spoke to an old principal of mine in Xavier School who said that we were doing this in the 1970s, that uh, the Jesuits, in a sense, in this school in the late 1970s were trying to stream uh, underprivileged children in, uh, in first in separate sections and then merging them into classrooms. I think the problem here is that you have, as uh, Abhijit says, uh, a completely game-changing idea, the idea of a right to education, which quickly finds that it runs into a kind of political and social inertia which the state is not willing to challenge, whether it's because uh, education is not amenable to a central will, being a state subject or not, is a different way. It's just that we have a shocking school system. I have a niece, for example, who teaches in a municipal school uh, in Sangabeha. And this is a school where the morning shift has 2,000 girls. It's a girls' school in the morning. It has 2,000 children. It's in the capital of Delhi. It's a municipal school. It has no toilets. It has no functioning toilets of any kind. So you see, this is a school in the national capital set up by the state, which has 2,000 girls who study there and no toilet facilities. So if the right to education doesn't extend, forget beyond parliament, but within parliament, you have a genuine difficulty on your hands. You have transformative legislation that is rendered impotent, impotent almost from the get-go. Well, I mean, uh, right to education, uh, Abhi probably has a lot to say about right to education. In fact, one thing they would say is that uh, uh, it provides for toilets, not for quality of education. And what you are saying is uh, it's not uh, enacted enough to even have toilets. Uh, so, but that, that kind of comes to this, uh, you know, my point about uh, having uh, a piece of legislation passed by the parliament. Uh, it's a very different uh, kind of uh, game than actually uh, implementing what uh, the, the act says. But let me, um, so th that kind of brings me back to the question of institutions and institutional reforms. Now, uh, um, I, I, want to, uh, I want to refer to uh, uh, S. Mogul Robinson's book, Why Nations Fail, where uh, the main thesis is that uh, the nations that fail are typically those where institutions are extractive institutions. And uh, in history, most institutions were always extractive, where a small group of elite basically used the institution to extract resources for themselves. Um, and when those extractive institutions did not get transformed uh, into inclusive institutions so that uh, the resources used are uh, uh, for all the citizens, uh, the nation failed. Now, uh, looking around uh, in our country, uh, certainly uh, many institutions, even at uh, whether they're panchayat institutions, the state level, uh, they seem like they're extractive institutions where um, even well-designed institutions functions uh, in the service of the local elite. Um, we worked on a research project where in Maharashtra and we saw, you know, lots of these government schemes really don't get enacted. The demand for Enrega is uh, never expressed because it's not in the interest of the, uh, the rich farmers uh, in the local area. So given this situation, I want to know what, what avenues are open to really change these extractive institutions into inclusive institutions. What's the expression where fools rush in, where angels were to tread, were to tread. Um, so I, I guess I, I don't believe um, 
that particular classification is that you, in some sense, it's a, it's the classic uh, example of a kind of reductionist reading of history, and I don't particularly believe it. So I, I, I think that most countries, and uh, through most of in their history, have had what, if you looked at them, would have very porous institutions. England in its famous years of, you know, when Asimoglu Robinson writes glowingly about England after the, the Glorious Revolution. It's an extraordinary corrupt country. You would have democracy, meaning that they have 14 people who can vote in a, in a corrupt book, in a pocket borough for somebody. It's a, it's a country which where, I mean, at the level, at that level of, of abstraction, Yes, there is some guarantee of rights, but I mean, we have a thousand times more guarantee of rights than England had in 1750. And, but somehow that looks much better to them than we do. I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't believe any of this. But, uh, I think everything is a battle. We, we have some, some set of historical accidents allow us to win certain battles, certain, certain sort of historical accidents. We lose some battles. Um, I think many of these things are a matter of luck and good design, and I think what's much more worrying than whether we have extractive institutions or not, my, my view, is the fact that when we have a chance, when we have a political opportunity to do something, we screw it up. That's what to me is much more depressing, is that we, when there's a political opportunity to design something well, we do it, we use ideology, we use, we use bullshit, we use... Uh, <laughs> all kinds of specious arguments. Okay, so give an example. Uh, <laughs> um, any example I guess will offend people in the room. Uh, uh, but right, 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 right now, this is a conversation of right to help. This is the, not happened. It's an insane idea. I mean, it's an insane idea not because people shouldn't have a right to help. But what it means is it immediately means a government delivering help. Now, if you look at all the statistics, 80% of all visits are to private doc practitioners, doctors, 75% uh, of them probably don't have medical qualifications, but 80% of all visits and growing. Uh, in Karnataka, 20% um, attendance rate by doctors and PhDs. Um, you know, we, we, we found 40%, 44% in Rajasthan 10 years ago, we thought that was bad. 20% is really, this is, so it, the system is completely collapsing, it's collapsing basically because nobody is interested in it. Everybody's checked out, so the doctors don't show up because the patients don't show up. And uh, it's not entirely perverse. I mean, and then if you look at the, you know, this uh, Jishnu Das and uh, Kartik's work on, on uh, quality of care, I mean, uh, the doctors, the same doctor, when, the, when he works in his private business, delivers orders of magnitude better care than when he is in as a government doctor. I mean, as a government doctor, he does basically does worse than not treating someone. Uh, I mean, that's their evidence. I mean, it's, it's so, so. What should we do? Well, I think just to take to but yet to go back to where we this came in. Uh, we, 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 we talk about right to education. Part of it is we need to cut the crap. <laughs> I don't want to take the, take the political will to, to punish these people. We, we really invest in, you know, Mr. Modi says he's going to do it. Let, let, let's see what he can do. I mean, let him take, take on the constituency of the doctors and say, if you don't show up, we'll put a camera in there. And if you're not there, will you lose your job the next month? Let's do that, implement it. It's completely implementable. The technology exists now of monitoring. If you want to actually, or you say that you're not going to do it, in which case, let's not talk about right to help. Let's accept the failure of the failure and then think of what we can do at the margin. We can think of, you know, improving access to private health care. We can try to, you know, these what they call Bengali doctors, uh, sometimes unfairly, uh, the, uh, the untrained doctors. Let's uh, you know, I always say I'm a Bengali doctor. <laughs> <laughs> so if, if you train, train these people to deliver some better health care. I mean, you know, let's forget about the, you know, this sort of idealized system of how things are supposed to run and do something that's real. I mean, those are, those are the choices we have. We could either be kind of 
they make the system work, or we can give up on it and do something piecemeal, both will be better than the current situation, which is to pretend that the idealized system exists because we are spending money on it, but it's not doing anything. You know, just, uh, uh, just a comment by someone who's not an economist on the business of actually designing uh, policy. Uh, I remember in the late 1970s when uh, M.G. Ramchandran introduced uh, Mindy uh, If memory serves me right, by and large, respectable economists thought that this was a dreadful populist measure that would bankrupt the exchequer. This was the worst kind of pandering that it was a political gimmick par excellence. And now we are told uh, by everybody, including uh, respectable UN agencies, that this is in fact central, uh, central to the business of spreading education in, uh, in, uh, in poor countries. So whether, whether these things are a matter of design or a matter of, as Bobsi said sometimes, of a uh, kind of happy accident uh, is I think moot because I remember uh, talking to someone, uh, uh, talking to Arjun Krishna who's uh, worked on uh, the business of uh, you know, getting out of poverty and staying out of poverty in this country. The business of the quality of, of the quality, quality of education in 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 Dungarpur in Rajasthan, there are lots of people, uh, lots of poor people who succeed in staying in school to class 10, 11, and 12. Their parents were agricultural laborers, and at the end of those 10 or 12 years of a completely dreadful education, not surprisingly, they find that they are still unemployed. So uh, you have uh, you have someone who's actually been through the gamut of school education supplied by the state, and then reverts in disillusion to exactly the substance that his, uh, his parents told him. Uh, I think the question of sanctions that Oji is speaking about seems to me, at least from the point of view of the BJP government, low-hanging fruit. There is a sense in which uh, uh, the most spectacular way of showing the sense of urgency is, and given the wrath of middle-class parents, the most popular one would be to hold uh, government school teachers to act to, to account. Whether they have the political will to do this is another, is another matter. But certainly, we could test out whether the notion of state education, the NDA government could actually test whether the notion of state-funded pub public education is workable given political will. And if it isn't, then we can move on to, uh, you know, uh, uh, to other models. But at least, this is something that seems uh, testable given its mandate and given its sense of urgency. Okay, now, I still want to dwell on this subject of institutions. Now, um, you know, when, when we talk about governance and institutions, I mean, it's a matter of collective action, right? Getting people to work together and um, make a local government work, come up with public goods, uh, schools, healthcare centers, etc., etc. Right? And when you say cut out the crap, that's true. That will reduce the noise, but it still doesn't solve the problem, right? How do you make these things work? Now, one of the things we know is that more homogeneous societies um, have fewer problems getting collective action uh, to work. Um, you know, so all these studies with uh, ethnic uh, uh, heterogeneity really actually uh, uh, makes the collective action ineffective and so on. Now, I mentioned uh, at the beginning that uh, the, the key thing that uh, differentiates uh, BJP uh, and Congress is really the uh, kind of cultural nationalism, right? And uh, Hindutva as a concept. And so when Savarkar coined this term Hindutva and uh, wrote about it, what he had in mind was, you know, that it would be, uh, the, the nation would be much more homogeneous, people who consider this their punya bumi, this is their land, this is their motherland, would work together better, and so on. Uh, so my question, I mean, clearly in a war time you can see the role nationalism can play. My question is, in peacetime, uh, this kind of cultural nationalism, uh, does it have any play? Does it have any function? Can, will it actually make collective action work better? Would it somehow reduce moral hazard and make people uh, take fewer bribes in the na a nation's interest or something like this? You know, uh, you know, I can see the temptation of what you're saying. 
uh, if you look at South Asia, uh, it's impossible not to see this at work. If you look at uh, Mr. Rajpaksha's uh, political formation in Sri Lanka, you have uh, essentially a transfigurist regime that represents, uh, if you will, uh, the victory of uh, of a Sinhala, uh, Sinhala majority, which is unapologetic about this victory. Uh, there is a sense in which Sri Lanka today is uh, effectively a majoritarian state, where, uh, where politics of that state, I essentially see, where, in a sense, the natural citizen of Sri Lanka uh, is um, a Sinhala Buddhist, in the same way as uh, the organic, natural, like these terms in inverted commas, citizen of, say, Pakistan is a Muslim. Uh, Sunni Muslim. Is a Sunni Muslim. That's right. Uh, uh, the human talent for divisiveness, even within uh, broadly homogenous communities, is limitless. Uh, we just, I've just been, uh, you know, traveling through uh, through Myanmar for the past uh, seven or eight days, and uh, it's an extraordinarily beautiful country uh, and. Uh, you know, a remarkably easy place for a tourist to be in, and you meet with civility and courtesy, but it's impossible not to be overwhelmed by the Buddhistness of the place. Not just uh, the Buddhistness that you notice as a tourist, but also what you read in the newspapers. The, uh, you know, the very strong sense that uh, this is a country constituted by uh, its, uh, its Buddhist majority, and that uh, people are welcome to stay so long as they recognize this important fact. And I think. Uh, we would, uh, it would be, uh, you know, uh, unwise to ignore the fact that uh, despite the Congress's uh, complete uh, political disintegration and decay, despite its cynicism and opportunism, in some uh, residual reptilian way, it stood for uh, a kind of pluralist nationalism. What is a pluralist nationalism? Uh, I use the word pluralist instead of the word secular advisory. There was a sense in which the Congress's political formation, when it comes together in 1885, is in this peculiar circumstance. It's trying to uh, address both the people, if you will, and the colonial state. Uh, it is a completely elitist, anglophone organ organization that essentially isn't an organization. It meets once a year and it passes resolutions. So it has to find a way of making its claim to be representative. Most nationalisms find a homogeneity to represent them. The sense in which, whether this homogeneity is defined in the classical European sense by language, or in many other circumstances by language perhaps in culture and religion. This is a problem for the communists because clearly India is so multifarious and so, so varied that it's impossible to invoke a single cultural identity. So what the Congress does is that it does something quite remarkable. It uses the census diversity of India that the British have only just begun to document in 1871, about 15 years before the Congress was founded. And in an act of extraordinary audacity, says that its claim to represent its India is the fact that it embodies its diversity. So if India is this, uh, is this jungle, the Congress is a human zoo, which represents all the different human species within it. So it's very careful to perform this diversity. It will have a, it will have a Muslim president. It will have a Parsi president. It will, be, it will have a Madrasi president. It will have a Bengali president. There's a sense in which the Congress wears every kind of Indian mockery to, in a sense, show itself as a coalition of India's diversity. And I think it pioneers, therefore, uh, a party contingent uh, and an extraordinarily eccentric kind of nationalism, which, however, recognizes the diversity of the subcontinent. The Congress recognizes that you can't fit Bharat Mata into petticoats meant for smaller European women. <laughs> so you have, you have, by the time the Congress actually comes to 1947, despite the extraordinary failure of its project, and its failure was, of course, partition, because India's largest minority, in a sense, a large part of it chose to have, to the extent that we can say it chose to have, through limited elections in 45, 46, a separate state. But despite this, the animating principle of the Indian constitution is a scrupulous attention to the idea of pluralism. And I think the challenge that the NDA government uh, faces today, given the fact that the BJP's MPs are entirely uh, there, are no there, there are no Muslims, 
uh, within the MPs of BJP. Given the fact that the voting percentages, insofar as we can, uh, uh, we can speculate about them through CSDS data, uh, Muslims and Christians, for example, uh, I think the, the figures are 9 and 8 percent allegedly voted for, uh, for the BJP. I think the BJP has to decide, the Swoti government has to decide whether, uh, despite its rhetoric about Sabka Vikas, whether it's going to be the Karta of a Hindu undivided family, or whether its metaphor for India is more expansive than that. I, I, I think I, um, I feel more, more qualified and competent to speak about this than I do than I am. I, to be honest, I, I must say that I, um, I unless I, I don't think the evidence that you cited is worth much. I mean, uh, we have a paper where we show that basically that if you run a regression in India and you put, you look at changes, there's no correlation with changes, between changes in uh, diversity and changes in economic performance. Um, Lakshmi and I have a paper on this. So, uh, so I'm, I'm not persuaded that it's that much of an issue. I, I think. We have many specific local reasons why that becomes an issue, and but I think I think the sense that somehow the BJP will be able to or the NDA will be able to provide a, a particular nationalism that will transcend the Hindu versus Hindu, the you know the caste Hindu versus caste Hindu, the, the, the multiplicity of the life is so. It's so fractal in some sense that it's like at so so many levels. I mean, you go once you go down to I studied merit in Bengal, and you look at where the divisions are. The divisions are way down. I mean, like you know, there's between the X X Brahmins and the Y Brahmins, uh, and uh, and so it's it's uh, it's uh, really uh, so. I don't think that anybody can transcend that. I think that the sense that somehow we're going to create now could could it could it, could there be an inspirational leader? Could there be a sense that you know I think people's behaviors do get changed. They could get changed by you know Gandhi changed the way we behave, and he changed in very substantial ways uh, and through many uh, what look like very trivial symbolic acts. And, but I think in some sense, so it's could it could be changes in uh, uh, Indian society, uh, any noticeable changes, uh, the, the way the, the way people behave or the social harmony or anything? No, I'm not saying that. I think bad things could happen. I think uh, uh, change could happen. I think it's just that it's very interesting to watch. The first time, some, you know, some. GHP uh, boys decide that they'll do something that they've been long yearning to do but have not have been sort of discouraged so far. And now that they have been, they feel that they've been endorsed by the electorate, why not try it? It'll be very interesting to how, how Mr. Modi and his government react to that. And in particular, through the, if it's going to be mediated to the state government, it's going to be even more of an issue. And, 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 and that's going to be very interesting to see because I think if the signal goes around that uh, yes, there is a certain amount of tolerance for a certain kind of behavior, then I think all hell would break loose. So I'm not at all saying that something bad wouldn't happen. Uh, I don't imagine something great happening on the cultural side. I do think that it's entirely possible that on the on the economic side, some some of the just the political clarity that maybe the government has will pay off in some along some dimensions. I, 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 that I can easily entertain. I don't see a, a, a real uh, you know, a sort of cultural revival that um, that's optimistic. It can see bad things. Yeah, I, I think I agree. Uh, I'm not sure whether there was a misunderstanding. Okay, did you think that I was suggesting that Modi would be transformation in a good way? No, no, I didn't. Uh, <laughs> um, I think, uh, you know, uh, 
one of the difficulties after a, a parliamentary election of this magnitude is uh, that even even your natural political instincts and your awareness, uh, you feel such much about them because you think that, all right, uh, so speak for myself, the political party that I'm wary of has come to power. And, uh, and then you say, uh, you know, how does one actually phrase uh, criticism of this party? Or uh, how long do you wait? Or uh, what is uh, what is empirically a sensible uh, interval for you to judge the performance of the political party? Because I think in a parliamentary democracy, it's a perfectly healthy instinct to say that, look, uh, a transition is taking place. It's a legitimate transformation. And it's also healthy to avoid uh, a kind of shrillness that seems to imply that you actually now want to elect new people because they didn't give you the government that, uh, that, you know, that you were hoping for. But I think there are some straws in the wind that you look at and wonder about their significance. For example, uh, uh, an individual event in Pune, there was, uh, there was a, a, a man called Mohsin Sheikh who was uh, beaten to death by uh, Hindutva de Lumpen uh, because of some alleged uh, uh, Facebook post uh, morphing images of Shivaji and others. And uh, the BJP MP in, in Pune responded to this, I think his name is Shiroli. He responded to this by saying that, um, um, you know, this is very bad, but if you have images like this put up, there's bound to be a reaction. So I think uh, a process of normalization in inverted commas like this, which happens all the time, within the Indian political discourse. Actually, disproportionate though it sounds, actually calls for the central government, especially a self-aware central government that has some recognition of the apprehensions that its ideological positions arouse. You would expect that someone in the central government, perhaps not Mr. Modi himself, would actually say, would call this out, would, you know, would say, this is, look, this is not, it's not a good idea to be saying these things in the wake of, uh, uh, of someone's death. And to his credit, Mr. Modi does mention a Mohsin Sheikh in the course of uh, a conference. But I'm not talking about tokenism here. I'm merely saying that, as Obijit said, uh, you know, there's a historical warrant for this thing. Uh, 1937, when India got its first provincial governments, there was a Congress party, which was unlike the BJP, rhetorically committed to secularism and so on. But it also so happened that all the governments it formed had most Muslim MPs, and in those days there were separate electors sitting in the opposition. So especially in UP, the Muslim League went to town saying that this is essentially a Hindu government. And the reason why their rhetoric sounded plausible was there were any number of groups not attached to Congress, very loosely attached to Congress, not at all attached to Congress, who felt that unki sarkar, that there was a sense in which finally at the provincial level you have an Indian government that seems to be made up mainly of Hindu faces. And so during the next Holy Muharram uh, intersection, people decided, uh, you know, Hindu groups decided to be more expansive about the way in which they interpret their rights. So, as Obajit says, it would be very interesting to see how the government actually responds to, uh, to, to the fringe uh, seeing in the election of uh, uh, an NDA government an opportunity. Okay, with this maybe I can uh, throw it open to the floor, so I'll take questions from the audience. Nani, is there a mic? Yeah, okay. <coughs> Questions? Because in some states, actually, they are controlling this, they, are, uh, they have actually controls on this. But most of the states, they have not actually, <coughs> they, have, they have not taken any measures to control the private, private practices of the public, public uh, doctors. <coughs> and also, actually, if you actually see the, pharma, the prices of pharma medicines, so actually, if you hear actually, uh, if you across actually medical, uh, sorry, yes, uh, the, across the countries, and prices are shooting up every time, and poor people are not actually able to afford. Um, they are not afford, able to afford the prices. 
So the, actually the thing that actually the point is that why the government sector, the public, the med med medicals, they can have actually shops, stores, medical stores, so to check the control, to check the, the prices of the medical medicines. <coughs> like similar. Oh, okay, okay. Just a question. Yes. Okay. I mean, I don't know whether I would, if I had to fight a battle, would I pick the battle of banning private practice? Uh, probably not. I would. I mean, there are many other battles. I mean, the health system is so dysfunctional that um, that maybe that's not the first battle I would pick. I would pick the battle of getting them to work when they are not doing their private practice uh, to actually show up and do you know do do the job with some some interest and effort. Uh, none of it seems to be in evidence right now. something to do with uh, left losing bargaining power in the national politics uh, and what is the future of left in the politics? <laughs> you know, I think uh, this is uh, this must be a very disheartening time for anyone who is uh, formally affiliated with the left because I think they are <laughs> No, I, I, I don't say this as a joke. I mean, I, it really is, uh, for the left, uh, deeply disparity done. Uh, they're down to nine seats. Their political strategies uh, seem not to have that much traction. But I'm not sure the failure of, uh, the, in, of the Republic to supply health 
uh, has very much to do with the success or failure of the left. I think it's autonomous art. From being from West Bengal, I would agree. <laughs> this is the state where they cosseted every possible ba bad behaving, uh, you know, government servant in every in every possible way. It's a state government which was, I mean, the, the communist government. One of the things that I think particularly uh, led to its eventual collapse was uh, a complete unwillingness to take on. Uh, vested interests in education and health and I mean for example I, I, I once tried to uh, do a research project on um, on school inspectors. I was interested in school inspectors because my great grandfather was an inspector of schools. So it seemed like a big institution. I went to visit them. They were sitting in an office. This is the Hooghly district uh, school inspector's office. And they were all sitting in the office. I asked them, do you go to, why are you here? Why are you in this office? And they said, we don't visit schools anymore because the teachers get very upset. <laughs> can, I, can I just throw in a question, I mean, uh, talk about the left. Um, I mean, it seems like uh, income inequality is increasing all over the world. I'm not just in here, you know, this, um, uh, Europe, uh, United States, and so on. Uh, uh, Thomas Piketty just wrote a book of, uh, about uh, growing inequality. And at the same time, you see an upsurge of right wing parties all over. What's the explanation? <laughs> you know, he, I, I, I have speculated enough for the evening. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing approaching it. <laughs> Wild <Why is> speculation. <laughs> <laughs> Perhaps you might want to uh, see Mark Perry Anderson's uh, work on alien ideology and just that limited to um, how the BJP and the Congress won't have too much to do with the right or the left and relevance or that plays out in the current scenario. Well, uh, as I remember Anderson's argument in uh, the Indian ideology, I think his uh, his indictment is within of the left as well because he of the Indian left. He argues that the uh, that the Indian left by failing to recognize the salience of caste. I think his point is not having uh, recognized the salience of caste has essentially made itself uh, you know irrelevant to the uh, to context to which it addresses. So I'm not sure what what your question was. Just trying to see how that plays out. Um, and this the book is actually what a couple of years old. I mean, yeah. uh, it's written um, it's it's written very recently, and I think its uh, its main argument uh, seems to be uh, its main argument actually basically, if I was to condense it, uh, is that uh, the Congress is and always has been a Hindu majoritarian party in secular drag. <laughs> and uh, this is, uh, you know, uh, this is an indictment on, uh, on such a scale, mind you, uh, you know, it's, a, it's an intensely argued book. And it's an argument with which I am in such complete disagreement that, uh, and, I, and I think um, is so completely at odds with lived, lived experience of politics in India that, you know, it would require two separate discussions themselves. Um, my name is Faisal Begum, from the University of British Columbia in India. My question is about higher education. I think the panel focused quite a bit on the primary education and the health issues, which are very, very basic. Uh, but what is the trend or what we will see in, in the next few years in terms of higher education? I think the previous government focused quite a bit on the expansion bit, and I think that trend is continuing. I think that is the evidence through the budget. But in terms of quality aspects, in terms of uh, mobility, etc., I mean, do you see any particular trend in the next few years? Thank you. I think it's an interesting question because I think I think everybody is. Many countries are up against it. I think that the general trend is that there's, you know, lots of people, uh, more people go to high school, 
most people want uh, a tertiary education. And on the other side, we have this so global phenomenon of rising what people call skill premium, which is means basically that you know people who could teach in universities are getting more and more expensive and more and more in demand. So basically, the universities have a very hard time attracting faculty. I happen to have um, participated in this process a little bit because I was associated with uh, my alma mater, Presidency University, who was reorganizing. I was, we were trying to hire people, and there were jobs galore, and nobody was applying. It's a really, it's, it's an enormous challenge. So I think huge challenge for India in the next uh, 15 years will be to populate the universities that many universities have been created. And if you see what they do, they often have part-time people who teach in five places or, uh, or work for a company and then come and teach a course. And it's really, it's, it, I think the price point where private education or, the, or these whatever these uh, universities can be viable uh, is not a price point people are able to pay. So, and the money that it would take to actually make, you know, make 50% of the population get tertiary education is just not there. I mean, it's, it's really an extraordinarily difficult problem because the, if you want to get really competent people to teach you, the salaries you have to pay. Right now, in the government sector, we are further handicapped by the fact that you can't be paid more than a secretary in government and, or a, a, a state, in the state government, a professor cannot be paid more than that. Now that means, now the secretary in the state government often has a house that's worth 10 crores, uh, but that's not counted for the professor, so professors get paid, this capped by what, what uh, the secretary gets paid and then can't have the real estate that the secretary enjoys. So it's, it's a very hard battle. I mean, unless we relax some of these constraints and somehow think of financing models that will work, it's, it's really, it's going to be very hard to attract the kind of people who should be in teaching into teaching. You know, as someone who teaches in, uh, uh, sorry, I just, I, I just, uh, uh, if you travel through, uh, you know, if you travel through any Indian state, one of the things you notice is large hoardings on the highway, advertising uh, new private education institutions, invariably colleges and universities, <laughs> typically uh, colleges of dentistry or professional colleges, but all of these are, are private colleges. Now, I'm not clear in my mind whether these are actually for-profit institutions or whether these are not-for-profit institutions that manage to turn a profit anyway. Um, <laughs> but it's clear to me that the expansion, the visible expansion in higher education seems to be happening privately. Uh, you know, just to address something you said, Ojit, about, uh, uh, about paying, uh, you know, paying lectures and, and readers and professors uh, a salary. I have to say that in the context of, say, Delhi University, the problem is the opposite. You have a lot of people willing to teach, except that it's a matter of policy, as far as the state is concerned, to hire them. Uh, you know, uh, there's, there's a wonderfully fine-tuned set of distinctions. So in the old days, it used to be, uh, it used to be permanent, temporary, and ad hoc. Now there's another, uh, uh, you know, there's, there's another step which is called guest. Guest basically means that you peddle your wares for a certain number of minutes and you get paid for those minutes. You don't get paid for Saturdays and something and so on. So it's not as if Delhi University is short of applicants for its uh, teaching positions at the salaries that are nominated now. It's just that the state has systematically chosen, in a sense, to retrench economically from one of the largest uh, and, in a sense, functional universities that India has, namely Delhi University. So um, uh, it seems to me that by, de by kind of default, the state seems to have decided that what you need to, to, what you need to do is allow uh, private educational institutions to proliferate, and that in this some way that in some way, this will make up for the enormous shortfall in university places. And a shortfall there certainly is, because, you know, in Delhi University, there are cutoffs that teach 100%. Uh, you know, I went to university 40 years ago, and if I look at Delhi University, uh, it's roughly the same colleges, uh, with, you know, maybe a big university, which offers an alternative, but not a particularly large one. So, uh, 
where you would, I think what's happened is that you've standardized school leaving boards, the say the CBSC, which in the interests of egalitarianism have reduced school leaving examinations to uh, a kind of grid of marking points. So if you have a 12 point, uh, a six mark question, you reproduce six points from a textbook that the CBSE prescribes. And you can see that the impulse behind this is to equalize the differences in social background that people who sit this exam examination come from. But then you have an inflation of marks. And you have this enormous number of people competing for the, roughly the same number of college places that were available when I was uh, applying for undergraduate degrees. So maybe the gap will be filled by private institutions. But uh, it doesn't altogether seem to me a particularly regulated or monitored business. Okay. Uh, my question is, uh, it seemed to me that a large part of the good discourse today was uh, spent on wishing away multiculturalism, pluralism that India has. Do you think that's relevant uh, considering this will not go away, India is a multicultural setup and we should rather be spending our time uh, working towards solutions to problems that exist? And we, do you mean to say that uh, you are going to award points to the Hindu ideology just because it sort of integrates the country together? Um, I, I think, uh, Obhijit, you join me in this. Uh, I think you got the wrong impression. Neither Obhijit nor Shok nor I have any interest in attenuating multiculturalism or awarding brownie points uh, for through the BJP uh, because uh, they might introduce a more homogenizing Hindu nationalism. I'm actually fatally appalled that you think so, but maybe we, uh, maybe there's a problem of communication. I, no, no, absolutely not. I don't think anybody wants to wish, certainly not in this, not in this panel, wishes to wish uh, multiculturalism away. You know, we, at least I see it as central to uh, the nature of Indian political life, and uh, you know, I hope it continues to exist. I want to ask a question of prioritization or feasibility. So India has lots of problems, if not a problem, social problems, we discussed a bunch of them. We have a new <coughs> central government. What can they possibly tackle? So we talked a lot about health. It's a state level government issue. So the only thing a central government can do is indirect. Uh, and similarly, you can say that about a lot of things. Some things take way longer than one electoral cycle. So you have a central government, there's Party, the political party just come into power, they are going to work with a five-year horizon. What can be feasibly and effectively grasped by the central government in a short time frame? I think many things. I, I, I think it's, um, I think, yes, health is a state issue, but for example, the government could, could disastrously institute a right to health. That also could, for, there are many things it could do and do damage. Uh, I don't mean necessarily good things. What good things it could do? I mean, I think in health, it's. I think the there are still. A, I think the political pressures are enormous uh, for. Uh, Keep keeping the current system going, and I think that if, for example, uh, a BJP-run state decides that it will take on the government, uh, the doctors, uh, the health system, I think that would be a very interesting experiment. And this, I mean, if the they then if that battle, when that political battle comes to head, the central government provides them with support because this is important. That's going to be go one way, if, it go, if the central government undermines them, it go the other way. So it's all, I think if the central government is, you're right, it doesn't directly implement many of these things, but it, it does, I think, send very powerful signals, it has resources at its disposal, so I, I think there are a bunch of stuff that it could, could, could do. And then on uh, many other things, of course, it has much more direct influence, I mean, on whether the, the National Green Tribunal will be able to have any influence or not, the central government will have lots of influence. It will depend on who it gets appointed to it. it, will, it and the same goes for the for the uh, for the Lokpal, I mean, who gets appointed. These things will have lots of consequences, and these appointments are crucial. Right? Thank you. Thank you.
first of all, that matter, the Prime Minister Supreme Court of Kufil, and we know that that's a bit of a uh, treacherous place right now. Uh, you know, in terms of, uh, of what the central government can actually do to send out clear signals about, uh, if you will, uh, propriety, neutrality, procedure, and so on, I think the Supreme, the Buhaha about uh, uh, Gopal Krishnan's non appointment to the Supreme Court is instructive. Uh, one of the things that it, uh, it at least told me was uh, the Indian state's reputation for opacity uh, is going to continue. Because what we had essentially was uh, you know, a family being sent off to the central government, the central government sectioning it, approving four, not approving a fifth. And then the lobbyists taking the high road and saying that this is you know, a delicate matter and I don't want to talk about this, but we have good reasons for doing what we did. Those reasons are never made explicit. And BJP spokesperson like Dr. Subram Swami going out uh, onto television shows and saying that, you know, um, uh, given the man, you know, he's a friend of mine, but given his position on Ram Setu, uh, you know, he betrayed the Hindu, so he doesn't deserve to be part of the Supreme Court. So I think, uh, I think one of the things that the central government could do is uh, to try, uh, you know, uh, to try and demonstrate that it is in fact different from its predecessor. Uh, simply in uh, high profile cases where it would be a to its own self-interest to demonstrate that, uh, uh, that it is uh, you know, a creature of legal and judicial and institutional uh, propriety. Okay. Uh, uh, I'm going to take the opportunity since I have a mic for everything. So Abhijit, you, you talked a lot about uh, tackling healthcare workers and attacking absence. Um, but my sense from the work that Rima and Iqbal did in Karnataka was you know, even, even for a government that was serious about tackling that problem, they ran up against the, the human capital constraint, right? Which is that you know, eventually they had trouble hiring people once you started forcing the nurses to, to go to work. So uh, is that something that, that you think is going to be, you know, is that a Kanaga case? Is that something that you think is going to be binding uh, elsewhere? Uh, or is it just an enforcement issue? At the level of performance that there is, I, I don't see that as being a major constraint because if, if you're going to get nothing from the nurses, then not hiring them is probably a good idea. You know. So I, you know, I think this becomes an issue if they actually start doing something. Right now, I don't think of it as being a huge constraint. Yes, sir. It's rightly said that the state of healthcare in the country is terrible. But a right solution has been suggested by Dr. Shetty, the famous cardiologist, which is to, to flood the market with doctors. But the medical profession has a vested interest in maintaining an artificial scarcity so that their incomes and status remain high. But the solution certainly is making medical education easier, cheaper, so that there's a lot of doctors. And that would really make the uh, healthcare accessible to all. On the issue of institutions, I mean, the answer is obvious. There are thousands of worthless government uh, offices and departments which need to be abolished. And, and that would be, uh, that, that's been promised also by the, by the new government, but it remains to be seen whether they're really going to downsize government. But that's been a promise of 50 years. <laughs> I agree that there is a huge problem of, of um, basically the, the uh, what's it called, the Medical Association of India exercising its uh, monopoly powers.
we adopted secularism and then divided the country on different isms, narrativism, majoritarianism, provincialism, brutalism, languism, languism, so on and so forth. So the same policy the British committed divided in Pira continued post-independence. Don't you think that these terms are misnomer in the Indian political context, that they are terminology to the exactitudes and the very antithesis of national integration are even unity in diversity. India has been a land multi tested very two thousand years ago we had Jews, we had Arabs, we had Afghans, we had Turks, we had Dutch, French, Parsis, English and what not. Everybody was here because the equipment doctrine of our saints and scholars, our peer the peer and prophet has been this, that and all else. And then there are many other quotations from India's first scriptures. This is one thing. No? So, okay. and, and the other is, part of that has been done about poverty, or illiteracy. Well, we know about illiteracy, which is now around maybe 75% or 74%. In 1944, the non sergeant presented a lost paper on British education in India, and he promised to make India send person literate by 1970. Then our leaders growled and grumbled, oh, it will take 25 years. So can, can I please ask you to speak to your question? So even today, after 67 years, our country is not sent person literate. And I remember one deputy speaker in Lok Sabha, one shouting in the parliament, that Congress has a vested interest in the retention of poverty in the country, in the retention of illiteracy in the country. Old poverty law can be said. There are many committees. The latest Arjun Sand Gupta committee, that 80% of the Sir, sir, I have to, I to ask you to stop. I have to ask you to stop. I have to ask you to stop. I'm sorry, I. I didn't actually get the question. I think, that we had, <laughs> I think it was a comment, but just uh, you know, just to say that uh, you know, diversity is a diversity is a social condition, but pluralism is a political choice. So I think uh, the Indian Republic chose pluralism as a political choice, and I I think it's been unified as opposed to divisive. I think you misunderstand me. I don't at all say that there isn't, this is not important. I'm just, I, I think the right to education is particularly badly thought out. Yeah, uh, I, I wanted to add one thing. Then what's the way of Economist way of Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I actually think that the right to education. I have seen so many panels. They go round and round. Give a single solution. RT is a solution. Yeah, but it's not a solution. He didn't try to solve the problem. And the problem is that the IP is a, uh, has absolutely no device for improving quality. It has all kinds of devices for improving infrastructure. And that that is the wrong act. It's not that there should not be a right to education. It should just be a really a right to learn. And this one is a right to being in a school with a certain number of rooms and a bathroom, uh, not a right to learn. <laughs> <laughs> this point was to 
to the race to the Lord Diana, he was just he's no more. And he gave a good answer. In the child is dying of starvation, you won't talk to him about calories, but he wants only the food. Access, if you provide an access, quality will be there. After some time, maybe. So, no, I uh, can, can, can I say one thing? I mean, you know, when economists criticize an act, right? The attempt is not to just throw the baby with the bathwater. They are trying to improve it. Is that there is a, uh, 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 you know, the whole uh, Asa reports are about quality of education, right? And the fact that the RT does not really do justice to that. And it is so. These things slowly improve, right? There is no solution that you can say, okay, replace RT with this, and this will cure it. So it is. A, this is a this is a democratic process where people kind of bring in their ideas and slowly things improve. There is no other way. Um, so I had a question. Uh, my question is very uh, in the backdrop of Moitrish Khadok's article that came out right before the election which showed that the UPA government's performance was actually pretty phenomenal for economic and social parameters. So is that, keeping that in mind, is the emerging challenge for economic and social performances is propaganda and politics that is just sprayed and a wave that is just created out of a hype or, and that performance doesn't matter in Indian polity anymore. Nobody has an answer to that, so we move on. My name is Misha. I am a security analyst with Oil Gas Services. My question to you is uh, I would like to understand your viewpoint about what Modi's strategy should be. What do you think his strategy should be towards uh, regional parties, particularly like AIA, BNP, and BNP, where uh, We've seen any, we've seen new PA before this going all out creating the anti cinema sentiment to the extent of PM even avoiding the uh, Chokopi. But now, uh, since the NDA is uh, sort of independent enough to not depend on these parties, how do you see the dynamics changing? Thanks. Um, you know, I think it is, the point you make is a good one. Uh, namely, that India's foreign policy is to be, say, uh, Sri Lanka or Bangladesh was inflected by the fact that uh, the UPA was mindful of uh, the opinions of uh, regional political parties. I can't actually, despite its majority, I can't see that uh, the NDA government will, uh, will actually dismiss the concerns of, uh, of regional political parties out of hand. You know, because India is, uh, you know, is a quasi-federal uh, democracy. There is a sense in which uh, foreign policy is in, uh, in a perfectly reasonable way fueled by uh, domestic concerns. But I think he certainly has to point out in a stronger position to be able to uh, carry the day should, because he, he's not dependent upon them for an electoral majority. So uh, yes, he, he certainly has more leeway than the previous government did. Whether he chose to, uh, you know, choose to exercise it, given the fact that in the Rajya Sabha he still is Many seats short of uh, uh, of a legislation uh, passing majority is not there. If I can speak on the right to education, I'm so glad you brought it up, and I really appreciate the previous question. But really quickly, a point of clarification: I, apart from the right to food, I run a website to monitor 25 percent clause. And it's not as bad as you're going to make it out to be. Because Delhi implemented this 25% clause with the public interest litigation 10 years ago. So today, on paper, 97% of these seats in private schools, with the exception of minority institutions, like the Xavier's that you spoke of, or Jesuit institutions, these seats are filled in Delhi. And in Maharashtra, it's not enough, so it's reaching 50%. In Tamil Nadu, it's 30%. So I think at least this aspect of the right to education, I would mean, think you could acknowledge that it is progressive towards learning and in a socially stratified society like India, a way forward. I, I, in fact, I have always written to support this particular part of the legislation and I actually was going to say when Mukul said that, I was going to say in fact what you said, which is that I, I know this evidence, so I was going to say in fact it's been implemented more than uh, 
more than one of the minor imagined. So I, 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 I do think that there are places where it's not West Bengal, nothing. Uh, uh, so, uh, but I, I think you're right. I think this this was a, a good idea. It, it, it's not that. I think I, I think uh, I want to clarify. I absolutely don't believe. And I, I think I said it. Actually, mentioned most of these things positively. I was trying to say that the UPA did something. I just think that many of the things they did were done uh, without without either with the wrong priorities or with clear, without clear thinking. Now, that doesn't mean everything they do was, did was bad. In fact, I think, I think the right field formation has been extremely useful. I think the, uh, I think overall, my assessment is that Narega was probably a reasonably good idea. Um, I think there's the stuff that I, I absolutely don't take the view that every policy that the government takes is always bad. I just think that one, I think there, was, there is a, I think our natural instinct in making policy is to make it on purely a priori ground. This sounds good. We sit in an office in Delhi, we draft legislation. Uh, very little experimentation, even less emphasis on exactly how uh, things will be implemented. If you look at the right to education implementation, you're right that in Maharashtra, lots of people, people uh, schools are now uh, now allocating some of their seats to underprivileged children. But a lot of the, the what absolutely hasn't happened is the, the allocative mechanisms for those seats has been like, you know, somebody's driver's daughter, or somebody's say, you know uh, domestic son. It's not a, a, a properly organized system. So this this part of the act, which was a crucial part of the act, was never thought through, never implemented the way it should be implemented, which is that you, know, you should give make the seats publicly available, create a screening process, get, give it to the people who need it. That part of it has not been implemented. And so it's 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 and that's a very good example in a sense of something that could be much better that is only half good because nobody took the trouble of designing the legislation properly. I'm, I'm happy to be corrected on that and, and thank you for saying this. Uh, so just so that we have, so uh, the Delhi public schools and the modern schools and the Sazapati Vidyalis all have implemented, uh, all their classes have 25% of each class is from a certain year onward is now under privilege. They haven't quite implemented that, some of them that some of them have implemented parallel classes. So there, there's, there's two different models, and uh, they have it depends on. So we have. Are you saying that in most of these schools that I mentioned, like kind of random checklist, you have integrated classes where 25 percent of the students are in fact under Yes, and the access has to start at the entry level. So it starts either at the nursery pre-primary or class one. And in Calcutta, there is the Loreto School, which yes. is actually pioneered this process. But they did it a long time ago. They did. A lot of it predates the Act, and that was the inspiration for putting it in the Act. But so yes, it's half baked, but give it another 10 years. <laughs> but I think it could have been full baked from the beginning if the people had. I don't understand why that's the attitude we should take. We should take the attitude that we, we want, this is a good legislation, let's make it a better one. And we should start from the beginning rather than fight ideological battles on protecting ter terrain on every point. And that's, this is the problem here is that everything is first seen as are you on our side or theirs? And <laughs> therefore, you can't have any conversation where we just say that, look, you know, this is. It's a good effort, let's make it better and let's start by acknowledging that it was not done well. I have a really brief question. <coughs> uh, cash transfers versus government What is this? I think that cash transfers, I think, is, is one of these issues on which I think uh, we're going to get a whole bunch of evidence pretty soon. Kartik has uh, disappeared somewhere, but he's done a bunch. He's doing a bunch of studies. Other people are doing a bunch of studies. I think we'll we'll see a bunch of evidence on it. We'll see what it does and doesn't do. I think there's no reason to have an a priori view on something, uh, especially something as complicated as that. Um, 
when evidence is going to be is round a corner. I think we're going to have a bunch of evidence on cash transfers. Good or bad? Uh, my question is planning for Google. It is something to my mind a uh, conflict of interest in the sense that the elected representatives, they are some, the elected representatives, I didn't get that. Sir. So it is something to my mind it's a conflict of interest. Conflict of interest. Yeah, so it's that the elected representatives they are supposed to be the voice of the people in the parliament. But people are often myopic and they refuse to accept that. So if you go back to your electorate, your base, and teach them something and tell them that look it's you know short term costs but long term benefits, they don't elect the next time. And what I have in mind is basically the geography of Western UP, where the representatives refuse to take on the caste and child on women rights issues, uh, where the agro price policy is often skewed in terms of power lobbies, and that often goes against the national agriculture policy. So how do you go about you know challenging this and taking on you know this potential conflict of interest? Uh, how do you do that? How do you reconcile the business of winning elections with actually putting into place policies that uh, serve rational um, long-term policies? Is is that the question? Yeah. Uh, yes. How do you go back to your electors having inflicted short-term pain uh, upon them? Yes. You know I. I have no idea. <laughs> I have no idea how, this is not frivolous, I mean, I have no idea of how you uh, institutionalize within yourselves as, uh, as a parliamentarian uh, a set of processes and instincts which allow you to, uh, to do this balancing act. So this is what the stuff of politics is. I mean, how do, you, uh, how do you reconcile the fact that you're elected from constituency with the fact that, especially in a parliamentary democracy, your principal uh, you know, your, your principal brief is to help formulate national policy, especially in, um, uh, especially in countries like that. I mean, if you look at, if you actually look at the number of MPs the Indian Parliament has, BC the Indian uh, population, and compare it to the number of MPs that, say, England has and its population, I once did a back of the envelope calculation. We need a parliament uh, for uh, the MP to population ratio. We need about 14,000 MPs. So you, you, you have a certain instance where uh, every MP represents a small country, or what is in effect a small country by, uh, by many global uh, uh, examples. So how does that person, I mean, he clearly can't do clinics or political surgeries in the way in which uh, you know, a British MP would. But yet he has to find some way of demonstrating good faith to the constituency that actually elected him. How does he do this? He does this by creating, you know, medical colleges, running railway lines to that place, uh, doing visible infrastructural things, or indeed at election time distributing, uh, you know, things that they want. But in a country as poor and as uh, and large as India, where single MPs represent vast constituencies, uh, this is always going to be uh, an incredibly difficult balancing. So I have two short questions, one for each. One is actually just rephrasing a question that was asked. Yeah. So one is just rephrasing a question that was asked earlier, and it's actually a question for Google, which is, you know, Vaitrish's article which said that the performance of the UK government is not that bad, but yet they got beaten so badly. Uh, and my question is actually, uh, what what are your thoughts on the change? That's a very safe. I mean, it appears to me that that's a pretty serious was of concern because I think the media played a pretty big role in these elections, so if you could share your thoughts on that. I also want to say uh, how much I appreciated your comment about uh, the lack of fraternity in Indian society because and I think Benny Anderson picks that up in his essay uh, from the caste dimension. Uh, it's evident in the RTE Act, you know, if all of us were to send our children to government schools, I'm sure the teacher turnout is going to change overnight. Um, and then the other question is for Abhijit, uh, which is if you could share your thoughts on the regional uh, diversity in the performance of all these programs, because we see that in program after program, whether it's NRAG or PDS, there are some states that are just abysmally bad and just dreadful and show no um, you know, change over time. And then there are some states that do really well, including on health, you know, there's Tamil Nadu, and even Himachal Pradesh, uh, it seems, is not very bad. 
Uh, we actually, thank you, we went back to some of the places you visited in Udaipur, as you know. Uh, some things have improved, uh, free medicines, diagnostics are actually available and that's changing patients with a seeking behavior a little bit. But on absenteeism, things have not improved very dramatically. But in Himachal, it was really, I mean, it's like Tamil Nadu. So if you can share your thoughts on why you think these regional, uh, you know, patterns emerge in schema the scheme and sort of are replicated across the you know, thank you for that question. Uh, two things. One, I think you're right. There is a sense in which we should be concerned about uh, patterns in the ownership of the media. The fact that uh, uh, that we might be witnessing a kind of consolidation of uh, of media, both electronic and print. There have been concerns voiced about uh, about reliance stake in in many media houses and so on. But let me also say that uh, we should be clear that this is quite different from the outcome of this election. You know, uh, I think there is a sense in which people, especially people who, uh, for whom uh, uh, the NDA's victory was an unwelcome result, uh, I think uh, they need to accept that this is not because of the media. That the reason this victory happened, uh, you know, uh, I have no way of quantifying this, maybe it's made uh, something of a difference in that. But I'm not sure that you, uh, that Metropolitan opinions often forged by watching English language news channels are actually very useful as uh, a way of, of judging the impact of the media upon, upon reaction. So I think there are two separate things here. One, there is something, especially in the wake of this election, we've seen, at least within the English language media, visible uh, moves, change, changes, shifts, which may have been interpreted or over-interpreted to mean uh, a kind of weather, weather winds, uh, shift accommodate a new political disposition. This may or may not be the case. But I don't actually think that this election was won and lost because of, uh, of media biases. I'm sure of which there were many. I think fundamentally this, the result of this election was determined by other larger things. So, so let me not, I, let me respond to your question. I think in not, I don't think I can quite answer your question because you know, I, but let me make the more general point, I think, which you are also implying, which is that I, I don't think, I think a lot of the, the, that evidence that, you know, some schemes work very well in some places, I think what one of the that thing that shows is, and in particular that it's very uncorrelated. I mean, that is to say some schemes work well in Chhattisgarh and other things really suck. And so it's not, it's not, um, it's not that the, there is some general governance capacity. I think there is some of that as well. I mean, I don't mind have more governance capacity, but in general, even states which don't have reputation for a great deal of governance capacity to do well on some schemes. And I think one of the things that's critical there is, um, I mean, for, for example, take health. Health is one where this clearly there, is, there are what an economist would call multiple equilibria. This is where you would have, you know, if the, part of the reason why no one shows up in Udaipur is, uh, is because unless there is like, you know, a specific medicine they want to come and get, get at the health center, they don't, because, it's because the um, nurse is not there, but the nurse is not there because no one shows up. And uh, so, there is a sense in which when, once these things are broken, it's very hard to restore them, but that doesn't mean that they necessarily have to break. They, you can think of mechanisms which are self-reinforcing in positive ways. If everybody participates, or at least the local, some part of the local elite participate in the, in the health system, then other people go and the, uh, the uh, health workers show up, and uh, then uh, if the health workers are showing up, then other people show up. Uh, I, I, don't, I, say, I think there is, certainly that's one key element in the story. There might be other things as well. Well, um, I apologize to all those who, uh, whose questions remain unanswered. But uh, it was all good things come to an end, and so does this session. Um, I would like to take this opportunity to thank uh, International Growth Center 
for sponsoring this event as well as sponsoring Ideas for India. I would like to thank the panelists and the whole audience for being here for two hours and making this a very lively session. Thank you.